<laughs> fietszaal. Um, stel je het volgende voor. Je bent geboren in India en je wordt door je ouders gestuurd naar een kostschool in Engeland. En daar groei je op en daar ontwikkel je je schrijverstalenten. En met het eerste, het beste boek dat je produceert, win je gelijk de allergrootste literaire prijs die dit land kent, de zogenaamde boekenprijs. Nou, dit precies is een Indier overkomen, Sanne Rushdi. En wij hebben hem vanavond bij ons als gast. Sanne Rushdi. Um, that book, it was your first major work. I yes, suppose. it was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the Booker Prize is, uh, I just said, boasting perhaps a bit, it is the biggest literary prize one has in England. But in, that is yes. in England it is, yes. yes. Um, I did, uh, it was very surprising to me. In fact, uh, I'll tell you how unexpected it was, because at the time that it was announced, you all sit there in this big room, you have dinner, you know, and, and they don't tell you beforehand if you've won or not. So you see, it's like, it's like, it's like the Miss World competition. You know, um, and when they when they announced it, I was smoking a cigarette. You see, so and and I had to get up and get the prize. And I was so surprised that I forgot to put the cigarette down. You see, so I arrived with this cigarette, and then they give you the prize in your other hand. So then I had the yeah, prize in one hand and the <laughs> cigarette in the other hand. And I thought I better hide this cigarette, you know, because this is on live television and the children shouldn't see it. All that. So so I put this cigarette behind my back like this. You see? And then I had the prize like that and the cigarette like that. You see, and what I didn't realize. Yes, and I didn't realize the camera is very high up, so you could see over my shoulder, you see. <laughs> so, so, so it's what it saw, this idiot holding a cigarette, just smoking up from behind his back. Uh, smoking Indian. <laughs> yes, exactly. So after that I gave up smoking. <laughs> Good for you. Um, Midnight Children is about India at the time of independence. And, and afterwards, afterwards, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about, it's really about the generation of children that are born at the time of independence in 1947 and who grow up mm -hmm. after that. So it's really about the children growing up in the country, so to speak, also growing from independence to adulthood. Mm. It must have been quite something that f to see the arrival of your first <laughs> brainchild. Well, it was very... In, in a language that is not your own. Well, well it's, really. it's my own by now. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I speak it reasonably well. Mm. <laughs> um, but there's the, no, I was very nervous about its reception in England particularly. I mean, it had come out already for, by accident. It came out in America before England and it was well received there. But somehow I'd been quite nervous about the English reception. And in fact, the night before it was published, I couldn't go to sleep because I was wondering what the reviews were going to say the next day. And in, in the end, my wife said, well, why don't you just go? Because, you know, the newspapers are printed at midnight and I live not very far away from Fleet Street. Um, the, the newspaper area, you know, and she said, well, why don't you go and get them? Mm. So I went off and it was raining, you know, and I got into my car and drove down there and I uh, imagined that if the papers had been printed, somebody would be selling them, you know, <laughs> um, but, but, but this is not <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, no, they, so in the end I had to go into all the print rooms of all the newspapers and collect the newspapers and they mm. thought this crazy person was arriving, but they were very nice to me and they gave me the free, the newspapers free, you see, mm. and then I sat in my motor car and it was raining and I'd read all these things and the next day I had a terrible, um, I lost my voice. <laughs> Good for interviews. Very right? good for interviews, especially radio interviews. <laughs> yeah. Shame, by the way, shame is all about Pakistan. Yeah. And this is the translation in Dutch now, schaamte. Could, could, could you pronounce that? Schaamte. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. Shame is about Pakistan. Well, roughly speaking, yes. I mean, a, pa a passage takes place How in come? India. Well, my family moved to Pakistan when I was 17. Um, more, I mean, about 20 years ago. No, so, so for the last 20 years, I've been uh, as involved with Pakistan, really, as as, as England or India, and. Um I suppose it's a, it's a novel which partly arises out of the recent politics of the country. I mean, it's about generals and military coups and so mm. forth. You, know. you have personal experience of generals and oh. marshals and... Yes, yes. Well, I have at least one general in my family. Mm. So that's a, you know, a disadvantage to begin with. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, but also, um, I, I once I learned something about military strategy because um, I, had, I uh, also knew a field marshal, uh, um, Auchinleck, the English field marshal. The famous Auchinleck. 
Auchinleck. Yes, yes. I, he was because he was a friend, old friend of our families. And Auchinleck, I went, Auchinleck was was the predecessor of Montgomery or, in the in or North not? Africa. In yes. North Africa. In I North Africa. Africa yes. Yeah. So he was yeah. the commander of the Eighth Army, mm. and then after that, he was the commander of the British Army forces in India uh -huh. at the time of the handover of power, which is how our family knew him. Mm -hmm. And I, when he was back in England as a retired, and I was at university in England, I went to spend a weekend at his house, and he asked me if I played chess, which I did, and and I thought this is a big chance, you know, to oh. play a field marshal at chess. Indian is, is not, student um, versus field marshal. Yes. Yeah. So so I sat down to play with him, and and he was very good, really. But he was also he was by then well over 70, you know, and and um, so he would make occasional mistakes, which were which were which were not, I mean, which he shouldn't have made, and he wouldn't have made if he'd been a younger man, you know. And as a result of this, I, I beat him, you see, <laughs> and, and, I, and he used to live with his sister, and I went after the game, very pleased with myself, you know, into the kitchen where she was, and she said, what happened, what happened? So, so I said, well, I, I won, you know, like that, very pleased. And she said, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I said, what do you mean, oh, God? She said, now we're going to have the most terrible weekend. Um, and it was true, he was then very bad-tempered, extremely, and then she drew me aside, and she said, what you have to do now is you have to ask him to play again. You know, at this time, you have to not win. So, so happens, lose. Yes. So I said to him, you know, would you like another game? And he said, yes. He said, oh, he sat down, he put the pieces out. And, and then I had to play the most difficult game of chess of my life, which is, I mean, he's a good player, you know, and it's very difficult to lose a game of chess with, without letting the other person know. Obvious that stupidity. That yeah, yes, because it's, it's, um, so he, he, he also knew how good or bad I was, you know, so I couldn't fool him. Did and you in fact, succeed? Well, I, yes, but I mean, he did win, in fact, but I don't know whether he won because he beat me uh. or he won because I was trying to lose. It's uh, like, um, but anyway, so it was one all, and then he never invited me again. Anyway, beautiful, <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful writer's dilemma. Yes, anyway, yes. thank you for being here on our show and telling us all this. Mr. Salman Rushdie, thank you. Thank you.